Welcome to Blaine Christian Church and our COVID streamlined service. I'm still not sure what to call it, so we'll just go with that. We're doing things a little differently right now. As you guys, most of you know, we're trying to seat from front to back. We're trying to social distance. We're trying to um, do offering in a different way by just having the trays in the back and communion by the uh, little cups in front of you in the seats there. Um, when it comes time for communion, we'll explain that, but it's just a matter of tearing off the top and taking the wafer and then tearing off the next thing and taking the bread. I have a couple of announcements. Um, actually, I have one announcement. Uh, Bob Bacon went home to be with the Lord uh, last week. On Saturday, this coming Saturday, on July 18th at 1 p.m., the family at their home on Eastman Road is having a uh, potluck gathering to sort of share memories. It's uh, very casual, but I wanted to point out that that was happening. We are here to worship the Lord today. To that end, will you pray with me? Oh Lord, most righteous, we pause to pray. We pray for the breath of your soul. We come to sing and for rejoicing in the joy of the soul that is put into music. We come to worship, Lord, for worship is the heartbeat of our soul. Bless what we do here today, that you may be glorified in this place and in our lives all through the week ahead. Amen. Will you please stand and join in our opening song? morning. When Jesus traveled around the countryside, he liked to teach his disciples and other people in parables. A parable was a story that had a lesson. Our lesson today is a parable. It's called the parable of the sower, but the sower in this story is someone who plants seeds, not someone who sows masks. A farmer went out to sow his seed. As he scattered the seed, some fell on the hard path and the birds came and ate it right up. As the farmer continued to plant seeds, some fell on soil, it was full of rocks. The seeds started to sprout and grow the very next day, but there was very little soil mixed in with the rocks and so the plants couldn't grow good, strong, healthy roots. In the afternoon, the hot sun just burned them up because they didn't have roots to get down into the ground to get a good drink of water. Some of the seeds fell on soil that had been taken over by weeds. And this is one I actually dug out of my garden yesterday. And you can see that with a weed like that, a seed doesn't stand much chance because although it started as a small plant, it quickly took over the rest of the garden. Fortunately, some seeds fell on the good soil and they had a good healthy start. That soil had been plowed and fertilized and weeded. The seeds made healthy plants and they eventually produced good fruit. Well, the lesson Jesus wanted to tell his disciples and us is simple. The seeds represent our heart. <clears throat> I'm sorry, the seeds represent God's word. 
and our heart is the soil where the seeds are planted. If our hearts are hard and filled with anger, the teaching falls on hard ground and never grows. Sometimes we hear the word and we get so excited and we can't wait to tell everybody, but our understanding isn't very deep. And so after a while, we just go back to doing things like we always did. That's like the seed and the weeds. The weeds take over. But the last seed is the best because it falls on the good ground. And when you learn Jesus' story, the seeds planted in your heart will grow and your life will produce good fruit. Jesus loves you and wants you to share your knowledge of him with everyone around you. Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Our Father, help us to be like the good soil. Help us to listen to your word and grow up to be the people you want us to be. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Carolyn. I'm kind of loud. That's awesome. Thank you. Would you please pray with me for illumination? Like a wise gardener preparing the soil for planting, Lord, prepare our hearts to receive your seeds of truth. And like a farmer who slices through the hard, crusty earth with a plow, cut through our sinful lives with your Holy Spirit. Plant in us your word, Lord, 
cause us to blossom and grow and make us a bountiful harvest that feeds a hungry world. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Our first reading this morning comes from Paul's letter to the Romans. Romans chapter 8, verses 1 through 11. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit, who gives life, has set you free from the law of sin and death. For what the law was powerless to do, because it was weakened by the flesh, God did by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering. And so he condemns sin in the flesh in order that the righteousness requirement of the law might be fully met in us who did not live according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on what the flesh desires, but those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. The mind governed by the flesh is death, but the mind governed by the Spirit is life and peace. The mind governed by the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. Those who are in the realm of the flesh cannot please God. You, however, are not in the realm of the flesh, but are in the realm of the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God lives in you. And if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, they do not belong to Christ. But if Christ is in you, then even though your body is subject to death because of sin, the Spirit gives life because of righteousness. And if the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of his Spirit who lives in you. And a reading from Matthew chapter 13, verses 1 through 9 and 18 through 23. It's titled, The Parable of the Sower. That same day, Jesus went out of the house and sat by the lake. Such large crowds gathered around him that he got into a boat and sat in it while all the people stood on the shore. Then he told them many things in parables, saying, A farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path, and the birds came and ate it up. Some fell on rocky places where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow, but when the sun came up, the plants were scorched and they withered because they had no root. Other seed fell among thorns, which grew up and choked the plants. Still other seed fell on good soil where it produced a crop, a hundred, sixty, or thirty times what was sown. Whoever has ears, let them hear. Listen then to what the parable of the sower means. When anyone hears the message about the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what was sown in their heart. This is the seed sown among the path. The seed falling on rocky ground refers to someone who hears the word and at once receives it with joy, but since they have no root, they last only a short time. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, they quickly fall away. The seed falling among the thorns refers to someone who hears the word, but the worries of this life and the deceitfulness of wealth, wealth choke the word, making it unfruitful. But the seed falling on good soil refers to someone who hears the word and understands it. This is the one who produces a crop yielding 160 or 30 times what was sown. There seems to be seasons in life, don't you think? Tourist season, for instance, or construction season, or both at the same time, depending on where you live and where you work and the route you need to take in order to get there. It's either orange barrels sprouting up along the side of the road or rows of cars planted all the way to the horizon. I actually had to wait almost three whole minutes the other day at a stop sign just to turn left. But there are other seasons as well, aren't there? Around here, it's cherry season. 
The sweets will start this week, in fact, and the tarts will follow right behind. The shakers are out of the barns and headed to the field. The cooling tanks are sitting on the pads. It's harvest season here in fruit country, right here in northern Michigan, which means it's summer, right? Not spring. So why do you think the lectionary brought us a parable on planting? Now, I understand planting's a common theme in Scripture, and I know harvesting is too, like at the end of time. And I realize that parables help lessons come alive. I mean, did you actually see those orange barrels in your mind just now as I talked about the road construction? Or visualize the cars lined up on that road? Could you picture the cooling tanks sitting on the pads, maybe full of water and bright red cherries? Word pictures are powerful, aren't they? But they're also context-specific. Where you stand currently has a lot to do with how you visualize a parable, not to mention how you comprehend the truth within it. The meaning is directly related to where you see yourself in the story. Are you waiting in that traffic jam late for an appointment, for instance, or are you simply driving around killing time? Where you are personally, mentally, and especially spiritually makes all the difference in the world. So with a familiar lesson like today's, our natural tendency is to think that we know exactly what's going on. We know what this parable really means, but try to set that aside. Lay down all your preconceived notions for a moment and simply step into the field with Jesus. Listen to what he's saying to the crowd. Listen to what he's saying to you right now. And may those who have ears to hear truly hear what the Spirit is saying. By the time we arrive at the 13th chapter of Matthew's Gospel, it's pretty clear that Jesus has had a very big day. We've read about him healing a number of sick people with various afflictions. We've seen him teaching extensively on the kingdom of heaven, arguing with a group of religious leaders over some finer theological points. Then, just prior to today's lesson, we see Jesus confronting his family and friends, making it explicitly clear that true family consists of your brothers and sisters in the faith. A lot's happened, and in a relatively short period of time. So when Scripture says that same day, referring to everything that's already taken place, it's setting the stage. That same day, Jesus went out of the house and sat by the lake. Picture, if you will. I bet he was pooped, don't you? I wonder if it's okay to say the Son of God was pooped. He might be out for a relaxing stroll on the beach or looking for a quiet place to just sit on the shore for a while and watch the sun go down. I imagine him enjoying a moment of solitude, don't you? Reflecting on his hectic day as the waves gently wash up on the shore. Or maybe he was considering all the hectic days that are still lying before him as huge white caps crash upon the rocks. Perhaps he's deep in prayer. He does that, you know. Maybe he's contemplating going for a swim. Might be thinking about fishing. We've seen him do that before as well. Maybe the waves are gently lapping onto the sand as the fading light twinkles and dances off the surface of the water. Picture yourself in a similar situation, if you will. Imagine walking on the shore of Lake Michigan after a crazy day of running errands. Imagine sitting on the beach of Crystal Lake. It's about the same size and shape as the Sea of Galilee, you know. Imagine trying to unwind in the early evening hours after a very busy day. Scripture doesn't really tell us what Jesus was feeling. We have no idea what's on his mind. All we know for sure is that his solitude was shattered by the appearance of a large crowd, so much so, in fact, that he gets into a boat and pushes off from shore. 
You ever had a day like that? You've been really looking forward to a moment of downtime only to have an unexpected guest arrive. What do you think Jesus was feeling? Interrupted, possibly? Exhausted? Excited for another opportunity to teach? I mean, it could have been any of these, right? Regardless, no matter what his current state of mind, notice that Jesus continues with his God-given mission. He uses the boat as an impromptu pulpit. He begins to teach even more and to teach, in fact, with a parable. Sound carries pretty well over water, doesn't it? Shoreline, in effect, is a perfect natural amphitheater. Everyone on the beach could easily hear him, so Jesus starts off by getting their attention, using a story from everyday life to explain the kingdom of God, a story that everyone could relate to, like, oh, I don't know, road construction and cherry season. Maybe at that very moment, Jesus looked up and saw a farmer on the hillside behind the crowd, scattering seed in the cool of the evening, and he thought, wow, what a great visual for what happens with the Word of God. A farmer went out to sow his seed. I assume you've heard this one before. In the church, we call it the parable of the sower, and that heading makes sense. Jesus is obviously the sower, and we likewise are called to sow the seeds of faith, right? We can even see clear dimensions of field dynamics here, right? You know, making your furrows really straight and such. This parable is great for evangelism committees, too, to explain why the Word of God doesn't always grow where it's planted. It helps us to consider outreach techniques, scattering versus burying, taking into account the direction of the wind, how much tilling is actually needed prior to the distribution of the seed. How do we maximize crop yield? What's the lost potential of wasted seed? How do we get the most bang for our evangelism buck? That's often how this parable is portrayed. Maybe you've noticed. But what if this lesson's not so much about them, you know, the crop, the harvest, what we might be able to make grow? What if it's rather about us? I wonder if we could see ourselves a little more clearly in the story if we simply renamed the lesson the parable of the dirt. I mean, I clearly see field preparation here, don't you? The need to dig out all the rocks and pull up all the weeds. We have to plow through the well-worn, hard-packed, crusted places in our lives, right? In order for the seeds of the Spirit to blossom and grow. We want an abundant crop, don't we? 30, 60, 100 times what was sown. Let's face it, the right dirt makes all the difference. Ask anyone who grows anything. But maybe it's not even so much about the right dirt. Maybe it's more about preparing the soil you already have and doing it in a way that it can receive and nurture the seed within. Maybe stop and consider your own current soil conditions. How is it that you're nurturing, cultivating, really, the holy seed that has been planted within you? How rich is your soil in this particular season? How's your current nutrient level? Better yet, what level of acidity does the seed of the kingdom have to deal with in your particular field? Maybe I should say that again. What level of acidity in your own heart does the seed of the kingdom have to deal with and overcome? Jesus begins his lesson by describing seed that falls along a path. In that day, farmers rarely lived on the land that they farmed. It was dangerous out in the fields. There were lions and tigers and bears and such, not to mention wolves and robbers. Instead, most people lived in the safety of a nearby village, much as they do in many parts of Europe still today. 
Each morning, the farmers would rise early, gather their tools and equipment, and head out to the field. And then each night, they would return back home along the very same path. Typical farm family didn't own acres and acres of land in the first century either. They only worked what they could manage by themselves as a family with rudimentary tools and their bare hands. The food plots, therefore, were extremely small compared to today's standard and lined up right alongside one another in order to maximize available space. Each of these individual sections were separated from one another by a narrow path that all the farmers traveled each and every day. You can probably imagine how hard packed and crusted over those paths would have gotten with all that foot traffic over generations of travel. In the soft rock and hard clay and arid Middle Eastern weather, those walkways became as hard as concrete. There isn't a single loose stone anywhere or a solitary tuft of grass. There just isn't a worse place for planting seed. And they scattered seed by hand back then. A farmer would reach into a sack that he had slung over his shoulder, grab a handful of the precious seed, and just flail it out in the direction that he wanted to go. Sometimes the wind didn't help. Sometimes seed just went where it wasn't supposed to go. Any seed that fell on that path was destined to just sit there until the birds came along and snatched it away. So in your personal soil analysis today, ask yourself if there are any paths that you need to deal with, any repetitive habits you've formed over time, behaviors, routines that are now so beaten down into your life that they cause you to be less than receptive to the Word of God? That's the question, isn't it? How's your daily schedule, your annual schedule, your hectic lifestyle hardened a portion of your heart to the kingdom? Are there repetitive paths that cause seeds of the faith to just lie there on the surface of your world until the wind or some voracious bird comes along and carries them away? The second type of soil that Jesus mentions is rocky ground. Now, we've all experienced that. The seeds of the Spirit are sown, but only shallow. There just isn't enough depth for them to mature and grow. The sowing might take place at a spiritual retreat or a camp or a conference. It might happen with a great sermon or reading an exciting book at a youth event or a Christian concert. It may occur as the tears pour forth in a quiet communion service or a prayer meeting. Anytime God unexpectedly warms your hearts. And these are all great times of planting. Don't get me wrong and with the very best of seed. Only afterwards, there's no effort put forth, no energy extended, nothing to help the roots grow any deeper. It ends up being a waste, really. When the scorching sun appears or the storms of life arrive, there's nothing to anchor you in place. When something bad happens, the kingdom seed is quickly forgotten. When you're not feeling all warm and fuzzy anymore, those shallow planted sprouts are easily snatched away by the enemy. When the world is telling you that you can't grow here or that you shouldn't be growing at all, when hardships come upon you or people challenge what you believe, if the seeds of truth are shallow, they just get yanked right out of the garden. Unless you reach your roots down deep into the life-giving nutrients, unless you weave your roots together with those of other plants around you, unless you have depth personally, you simply will not grow. The third type of soil that kingdom seed encounters is soil that's infested by thorns. And I think we're all familiar with those as well. How many of you have run into thorns in your spiritual growth? How many briars have pricked away at you or tried to keep you from growing? How many thistles or crabgrass plants or overgrown ferns even have tried to block out the sun or choke the very life right out of you, even at your healthiest time? 
We know what thorns are, right? There's no question they exist. The question is, can you identify them in your own garden? What are the noxious plants that need to be removed right now? And before you start naming names, bear in mind that Jesus said that the weeds, these things that choke our growth and make our spiritual life unfruitful, are, quote, the worries of life and the deceitfulness of wealth. Do you realize that those are the two poles of the coronavirus fear right now? The worries of life, will I stay healthy or not? And the deceitfulness of wealth, what about the economy? And do you realize that self-reliance can also be a weed? Some of your thorns might include your career or your stock options or your retirement plan. A vacation schedule might be choking you, as can the idea of everything in life is all set. Or it might be the opposite, the fear of not making the mortgage payment or the worry over health concerns or an uncertainty with family issues might reach out and smother your spiritual growth. Mark in his gospel adds, quote, the desires for other things to Matthew's list of weeds. That would include envy, right? Luke includes pleasures in his list from what keeps us from maturing in the faith. And I'm sure we can see the pitfalls in that. People go their own way, he says. So our potential list of weeds has grown considerably now, hasn't it? Now it includes things like entertainment and guests, canoeing and golf, athletic events or social obligations, exercise or even relaxation or just plain fun. Anything, absolutely anything that is of ourself rather than of God can be a poisonous thorn. The good things as well as the bad can get in the way of producing fruit for the Lord. So is there a weed or two in your corner of the garden that maybe needs to be plucked? Or better yet, some that need to be yanked out by the roots. Can you identify any noxious plants or overgrown ornamental flowers even that need to be trimmed back some in order for your faith to grow? Are there briars lurking in your family plot, tough, tenacious weeds that reappear perennially, weeds like worry and fear? Are there broad leaf pests blocking out the light of the sun, things like depression and doubt? Is the mold growing around your roots because of too much leisure, too much pleasure, too much relaxation? What weeds of this world are choking off the seeds of the kingdom? That's the question. That's the question Jesus raises in this parable of the dirt. What type of soil do you currently have and how can you make it better? In Luke, Jesus describes good soil as those with noble and good hearts. It's a great image. Good soil receives the seed, quote, hears the word and retains it, he says, and by persevering produces a crop 100 or even 60 or 30 times what was sown. Good soil, we're told, is soil prepared to receive the seed, thoroughly tilled and ready to go. It's soil that's well watered and balanced with just the right amount of nutrients. It's rich, deep soil, free of weeds, soil that combines the firmness of a grounded faith to hold the plants together with enough looseness to allow new shoots to grow. There's water retention to nourish and nurture, but also enough runoff to purify and clean. There's both light and heat and enough coolness and shade. There's balance, in other words, of all the things kingdom seed needs to grow healthy and strong. Remember, this parable is told by the ultimate sower, the one who scatters perfect seed. So our task is to assess our current growing conditions, make corrections accordingly. It's not to try to modify the seed so that it fits into what is currently comfortable. That too might bear repeating. We're not to modify the seed 
so that it fits into the soil we already have, but rather adjust our soil, the soil we have, in order to nurture the perfect seed. Our role is not even to compare the different brands of seeds to see which one we like. It's honestly asking yourself if you're taking enough time and spending enough energy to grow deeply and well. Are you developing deep, strong root systems, one that intertwines with the roots of others? Are you thriving right now or simply withering away? Have you become sedentary, sort of stuck in the mud? Are the edges of your leaves starting to turn brown? And what do others see when they look at you? beautiful garden or well-ordered orchard or simply an overgrown field full of weeds? How about over the changing seasons, over time, as they've watched you grow? What type of soil surrounds you right now, and how has it changed over the years? Remember the goal of kingdom seed, like cherry trees or any other plant for that matter, is not to create plants that are happy or who enjoy being part of the farm or who look beautiful on the outside. The goal, the very purpose, is to grow lively plants that produce fruit for the kingdom, fruit to feed a hungry world, and ample seed to ensure life for all the future generations to come. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. Your hearts, and if the Spirit is moving you to make a confession of faith or to reaffirm one you've made earlier in your life, or if you would simply like to join membership with this body of believers, please come forward as we sing. Will you stand? waving at me so I <laughs> to be a, a member of Blaine Christian Church is the same exact requirements as to be a Christian in scripture that's to believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that Jesus is the Christ the son of the living God so Paul I ask you do you <laughs> Jesus is the Christ the son of the living God and do you accept him as your personal Lord and Savior and I welcome you as a member of this church can we pray or we can clap and then pray if you prefer that. <laughs> oh, holy God, thank you so much for Paula and for this church and for 
uh, bringing everybody together. God, I just, um, I just feel so blessed to be here, and I know Paula does too. And Lord, I just thank you for the folks with their smiling faces behind their masks, and I just ask you to help each and every one of us to make a home for Paula and help Paula to just fit right in, Lord. I just ask you to bless her today and always and just be with each one of us and ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. God bless you. Take my mask off. Mask off, mic on. I'm so glad I have all these people watching out for me. We now come to the time when we share prayers with one another. And as we're not doing prayer cards right now, um, I'll pause in the midst of the prayer itself. And you can verbally share names of people that you would like to lift up before the Lord. If you would like names on a prayer list or on the e-prayer that we send out, please contact me or the office during the week because we're not writing these down right now. So just let us know or hand me a note afterwards would be fine. Can we pray together, please? Oh, Lord, patiently and faithfully, you watch over our little patches of life. With unlimited love coupled with bountiful grace, you guide us towards the goal and towards the prize. And with sternness and firmness, you teach us your ways, molding each one of us and shaping us into useful vessels to carry your word throughout the world. Lord, you've graced our lives with so many blessings, blessings which we need to count and name each and every day, blessings which we need to realize and appreciate. You've given to us from your own hand. You've loved us into being and smiled upon our life. Now please, empower us to do the same to those we encounter. Lord, you've healed our hurts, and you've claimed, calmed our fears, and you've taught us the things that we need to grow. Allow us now in the name of your Son to do this for others. Make us instruments of love, Lord. Make our hands your healing hands and our lives and our mouths doors through which others may glimpse your kingdom. Make us the seeds of faith, Lord, that plant your gospel into the lives of this world and use us powerfully to touch the lives of our loved ones, some of whom we place now into your care. Holy God, please be with The family and friends, family and friends of Bob Bacon. The family and friends of Reverend Robert Collier. the family and friends of Marsha Stotes and with Dave Young. Please Lord, reach out and touch these precious loved ones with compassion. Please pour out life and love, health and healing, security and peace upon each and every one. And again, Lord, please touch us and empower us and equip each one of us to do the same in your name. With the very prayer that your son taught us, Father, we now place these requests before you, praying, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. 
and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Again, we come to our time of communion and we invite you to partake and share with us. If you don't feel comfortable doing it with the words of institution, do it as we actually take the bread or take the communion with you and do it at home. And if you don't feel comfortable even partaking of communion, that's okay. God understands. Let us pray. Holy God, this table is the place that brings redemption and healing to our lives. It's where our selfishness and sin can be clearly seen. And through your power, we can turn away from sin and receive forgiveness. Fill us with your Holy Spirit, empowering us to live a life of obedience and devotion to you. Amen. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took bread. And after blessing it, he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples and he said, take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Likewise, after supper, he took a cup. And after giving thanks for it, he gave this to the disciples. And he said, drink of this, all of you. This is the cup of the new covenant in my blood which is poured out for the forgiveness of sin. These things do in remembrance of me. benediction today is one I used two weeks ago, but it is so apropos to both of our readings today that I thought we should do it again. It's Galatians 5, 22 and following. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law, those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and its desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Amen. Amen.